Hello, everyone. Hi, welcome. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on this uh, webinar about classroom management. My name is Kari Lisa Johnson, and I'm the marketing director for Boom Learning. And we're very excited to have you joining us today. We're excited to have Stephanie Claros with us for today's webinar. And Stephanie and I will be sharing from our own classroom experience, both teaching and tutoring, uh, to give you some really special hacks that you can use for classroom management. So we'd love to get to know you all right now, and we'll be sharing a poll with a couple of questions for you. So while everybody is joining, that's a great time to get started on this poll. And hopefully you can tell us a little bit more about you. Uh, you can put in the chat where you're from. We'd love to see all the different states and countries. And we also want to let you know that we are recording this webinar. So you'll be able to find the recording on our YouTube channel. We're also live streaming it on our Facebook page. Ooh, okay. So we've got a lot of general education teachers so far. And we have US and the Canada and Canada mostly represented. Let's see what people say in the chat. We have Erica from New York. We have Mindy from New Jersey, Heather from Michigan. Welcome everybody. We have Marina from Texas. Okay, that's great. Stephanie's representing Texas uh, teachers as well today. So Jesse from Ottawa, Amy from Louisiana. So just a little bit of housekeeping. We have a chat box uh, that's part of the Zoom interface where you can drop your comments throughout the webinar. And if you click on the chat box, you're going to find links to our YouTube channel and Facebook page. Um, and throughout the event, you'll also be able to ask questions. And you can ask those questions in the Q&A box, and then some of them will be answered in writing, and some of the questions will be answered by either me or by Stephanie uh, live at the end of the presentation. So be sure to post your questions, especially really tricky classroom management conundrums that you've been dealing with or any advice that you need about classroom management. So at the end of the webinar, we'll be reposting the links to our social channels, as well to the, as the link to the next event, which is going to be our intro to boom learning webinar, which happens on the first Wednesday of each month. So now I'd like to introduce Stephanie um, and Stephanie, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your history with project management and uh, classroom management? Yeah, welcome. Welcome everyone and thanks so much for joining us this afternoon or from wherever you are in your time zone. Uh, we're so happy to have you here and we hope we can provide some helpful uh, information that will contribute to maybe a better classroom management situation or just to add to your classroom management repertoire. So I, uh, I was teaching in Texas, so for those of my Texas teachers, I am representing for you too. I'm over on the West Coast now, but um, I had a wonderful time teaching there. I started as a K through eight generalist. So I see a lot of you are uh, gen ed teachers. And I did start in kindergarten and first grade. And, um, but I found my sweet spot in seventh grade. So I became a uh, subject matter uh, humanities, history and social studies teacher in fourth through eighth grades. I'm also certified in ESL and I work with almost all populations. Um, so I've, I've taught the inclusion classes, um, pre AP, uh, ELLs, 504s, right? All of our groups that we love so much and that um, definitely challenge us to do better at our classroom management. So that's a little bit about me. I also began my teaching primarily in Title I schools. So I'm very cognizant of what it um, is like to teach without a lot of resources. Um, so sometimes we're going on the fly. Sometimes, you know, I remember our printer would be broken and we have to just sort of pivot. And so classroom management really is the foundation of how we get curriculum disseminated to our students each day. So with that, we can begin our first hack. I'm not sure how many of you have just 
um, started in the profession, if you've been teaching for a long time, these are hacks that I hope will benefit everyone. And those of you who are in gen ed or in elementary school, I know that you guys are so creative at adapting any information to your little ones. So, And the group is mostly elementary school and gen ed, but we'd love if you add in the chat um, how, how long you've been teaching. That would be really interesting. Okay, so we're here for five easy hacks for classroom management. We all know that not a lot is easy in the classroom, but let's see what we can do. So my first hack is bell ringers. Bell ringers, bell ringers, bell ringers. This is the way to start your morning or the beginning of your class for my middle school and high school teachers every single day, all year long. Um, a bell ringer is an activity or a small assignment or can even be a mini assessment that students complete when they first enter your classroom. They typically will consist of prompts uh, related to concepts that you're currently discussing in class. Uh, they can also be ongoing practice. So say you're a math teacher and you just want to keep those math processes up and have the students you know, reminded of how they get through their problems each day. So bell ringers are um, not only good for students, you know, so the question is, why is this a hack? I'm sure you may have heard about bell work. One, you know that your admin would like you to be teaching from bell to bell. Um, or, you know, from class to class for my elementary school teachers, but this is a hack because they offer so much more than just our students um, getting to settle in and start an activity right away. Bell ringers, first of all, let's move my slide. So first of all, bell ringers reinforce learning. They'll um, allow you to activate prior knowledge. So if you're starting a unit and you want to know what do students already know about your topic of study, maybe that's um, multi-digit multiplication, maybe that's the Civil War, maybe that's um, the Senate or the government. So you can activate prior knowledge by just getting a quick read on what do your students already know before you launch into a subject or a topic. Also, um, it allows you to do quick formative assessments. So, oh, let me go back, I'm sorry. Also, <laughs> when you are learning your topic, you can always reinforce that learning. So say you taught the day before on Civil War um, battles, you'll be able to see what did they pick up yesterday? Do they, did they remember? Do they still know? Um, so that's a great way to reinforce learning. But most, mostly, most of all, um, Bell ringers really first and foremost before your prior knowledge and reinforcing learning, and I'm going a little out of order here, but uh, bell ringers create a sense of predictability. They create a container for safety and expectations coming into your classroom. So why does this apply to classroom management? Because when your students come in and they know what to expect, they know that they're gonna come in and immediately engage in independent work. Um, that usually will quiet your classroom down. They'll know what they're doing. They'll feel safe. They'll get right to their work. And of course, it'll quiet those students down and get them engaged. So what does that do for you? So bonders offer so much bang for your buck, really. Um, they, they require silent, silence in your classroom at the beginning of your class. And it's a great grounding uh, method to settle your energetic students down into your room and prepare them to think and engage. Um, bell ringers will also allow for formative assessments. So this helps targeted learning. They allow you to do a low pressure check for understanding to see where your students are at. And um, if you're using bell ringers um, or boom cards with your bell ringers or as bell ringers, you'll be able to quickly analyze student data. So there's a bonus reason why I bring this up as a hack. And that's because as teachers, in the, at the beginning of a class is a lot of times one of our busiest moments. Sometimes transitions get very busy or loud or sort of chaotic, but that first entry into the class is really where we have students most likely coming to us that were absent yesterday, that might need work or asking us questions. Um, and that's a time we're taking attendance, maybe doing administrative things and having an activity for students to come in and sit and engage in right away quietly and independently allows you to take care of those things. So I want you all to sort of consider this idea, which came to me when I was, we were building this out is, 
Um, have any of you tried to put a baby to sleep when you're stressed out? And we try to do this. Like I just, okay, yeah, I'm stressed out, but you go to sleep and then after, you know, you fall asleep, I'll, I'll deal with my stress. Um, it never, ever works, right? You basically, that child, whether you were you know, watching a child or you have any of your own, they will not go to sleep until you have calmed down. And this is very much the same in your classroom and with your students. Children, if they're 13, if they're 18, if they're five, they have that same sense about them. If we are stressed or frazzled as teachers, they will know. And it's not that they're taking advantage of that, but they really, you know, they mirror our feelings. So when we're calm, when we have a routine, when we know what to expect, then we really allow for that safe space for the administrative things, talking to another teacher that might come in and need your help. Sometimes admin comes in to speak with you. Often that happens at the beginning of a class period. So bell ringers are something I would implement immediately to give yourself that breathing room to be centered and grounded yourself. Um, and to be able to get done what you need to without losing control of the class. And to get those, the kids to have a safe, predictable environment, uh, reinforce your learning and allow for formative assessments. You know, your quick check for understanding and also just keep that quiet um, activity first thing in the morning. And then from there, once your bell ringer is finished, it's usually it'll take about five to seven minutes. It can take four to six, depending on whatever curriculum you have planned. And from there, you can launch right into your activities. So I wanted to give you guys a quick example of a bell ringer. This one, before I let it play, this one is just a figurative language Halloween themed story where the students will read a story and in it, they're gonna pick out the, the figurative language that they see in each sentence. So we'll let this play a minute. So you get the point. And this deck has maybe 50 cards. Yeah, it has 50 cards total in it. So if you wanted to do a short bell ringer, maybe you have a lot of curriculum to uh, get through that day, you can always do 10 at a time for the week. So you have 10 cards per morning, per day, Monday through Friday, as a bell ringer for that topic or unit of study for that week. And I wanted to, for my, my elementary, uh, teachers give one other example for just upkeep. So constant reinforcement of processes like math. This one stop. Let's keep All right. So this is an example. We're getting some great questions in the Q and er, in the chat. So just a reminder to everybody to post your questions in the Q and A box. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thanks for that reminder. I think we are all guilty of that. Even I was on a webinar posting in the chat. All right, so this is just this is another one that would just be constant reinforcement of learning each day. And you can give these to your little ones. This is a second grade math deck, and this would be your Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday of bell work. And say a student clicks on that Monday. These are some of the cute things they see. I thought this one was pretty adorable. And it goes through various uh, math processes and different different skills. Oh. There go. I see some. Okay, we'll pass through that one. I think you get the point. So those are just great ways that you can just take that time, get your students engaged, get them quiet, ground them, ground yourself, take care of what you need to do and know what you're doing each day. And, and even for those days that you are um, having, you know, last minute curriculum pivots or changes, that five minutes still allows you to do that. 
Okay, so hack number two, a student contract. Again, these are things that you may have already heard of, but I really want to tie in why these are important hacks in classroom management, particularly. Um, so the, the recommendation always is at the beginning of the year, have our students you know, create this fast contract. But if you haven't yet, it's okay. We often get students enrolling still throughout the month of September, so now is a perfect time. And a student, and a student contract answers the question, what do we want out of our learning environment? What do we want our learning environment to feel like? So I was a social studies teacher, and of course, um, I had to teach the preamble and the constitution, and I uh, always like to use the preamble as my class contract. I did this with seventh graders. Uh, we would write it up on the board, and my students would pick out of just us all going up to the board and writing down our values. So first, we had, you would have a discussion with your students about what matters to them. What, what do they like in a classroom? What's their favorite thing? How would they like to feel? How would they like to be treated? This is really a question or a matter of what are your values? And this is a great time to, one, learn from your students about what their values are. How do they want to be treated? What is the most important thing to them in their learning environment? You get it right out of that, you know, right from them, right from the source. And it also allows them to think about what are my values? Who do I want to be? How do I want to feel? And if, um, you know, that's, if they can think through how they want to feel, then we can, you know, try to agree on it. So I always start with what are values, right? Values are something um, that are held to deserve or the importance, the worth, usefulness of something, right? It's one's judgment of what is important in life. Is it important to um, to give compassion? Is it important to feel compassion? Is it important to feel safe to express yourself? You know, what are the things that matter to them? And I know that we can make them age appropriate also. If you've got first graders, third graders, and fifth graders, beautiful, think of beautiful things to say. Um, and it's also, you know, what's, um, what's important to you in life? And so you can really get to know your students that way. And also it helps you to value your students, right? To remember that they are people that are thinking about how they feel and, and what their surroundings are like all the time. So that discussion is key for two reasons, um, because it helps you understand your students and then it also helps them understand in turn how they would like to be treated and how they will need to treat others. So here's, a, here's an example of my preamble. And we did turn this one, one of our awesome boom agents turned this one for me into a boom card. We really, we'll, we'll go back to this in just a moment, right? Discuss a little bit of this. But this is just letting them pick their rules, um, creating that contract. So let's have a look at this. It'll look something like this. You can do this on paper, you can do this on a board, you can do this on paper paper. We are experiencing just a little lag here. It paused. You have to click the screen again. Here we go. It's it's spinning. Let's try again. Well, you can see that the main point is to be able to drag and drop. Use the boom cards to drag and drop the different um, uh, values into the slots, so that the students really get to pick their own wording. So the gist is just to, to find those values, to compile them, write them down, and then you can drop them in to whatever creative document or poster or drawing that you like. So this was, this was sort of part of how we did that. And one of my classes, I'll just go back for a moment, uh, since we're on the slide, one of my classes I actually wrote here for you. Um, they created one that said, um, we the people, and I had a cactus that was our school mascot, and so or our classroom mascot, and so they called it Mr. Tappy. It was a very red, prickly cacti, <laughs> and um, they called it Mr. Tappy, so they said, we the people uh, of the land of Mr. Tappy, in order to form a more perfect fellowship, establish teamwork and collaboration, 
ensure a peaceful learning environment, provide for the common tolerance, promote the general academic excellence, and secure the blessings of laughter and freedom to ourselves and our fellow classmates. Do ordain and establish this constitution for the land of Mr. Tappy. So it became just something very fun and sweet. And once we created that, I actually had, we took a picture by it. Uh, they all signed their names. We posted that up in the classroom and reinforcing the contract. So posting the contract, reinforcing the contract um, is an interesting, an interesting thing to do because I think oftentimes reinforcing a contract is sort of like, hey, you're not doing what you said, you wanted the rules to be. And the contract, the idea of the contract is really so that they are reminded that these were the values that meant something to them. This is how they wanted to feel in their classroom. And they're not so much rules as they are, like the words that we used in, in this one, they want laughter to be you know, important. They want freedom in their classroom, right? That was some of the last, the last words that they, that they used. But the, some of the first words they used are tolerance, academic excellence, uh, peaceful learning environment, teamwork, fellowship, collaboration. And pretty much any behavioral issue you're having, you can look over at your contract and say, hey, is this in the spirit of teamwork? Right? Is this in the spirit of collaboration if you won't share your scissors with, you know, with your shoulder partner? Um, we can usually take those values. And so instead of making them harsh or making them rules necessarily, even though we know they're rules, um, letting them know that this is what they agreed to because this is really what they, they want and what, how they want their classroom to be. So that is hack number two. And one thing I can't stress enough is the consistency for um, making sure that these values and that this contract is adhered to because that is what builds trust. So these all sort of go together. We have the routine when it comes to bell ringers. And then this contract is what allows students to trust you. So if one of our values is you know, to not allow discriminatory language in our classroom, and you know, we address it six out of 10 times, we're gonna have 40% of our you know, face time with our students with a, a lack of trust with us. So that's something we really wanna um, drive home is just to reinforce that. It's just to address it every single time. Hey, I never allow that ever, <laughs> you know? Um, so that consistency, I'm sure you all know by now is, is critical critical to the classroom management. I'd say it's one of the most critical things we do is to be consistent. And that is again, why looping back to bell ringers, when we create a routine for ourselves as teachers, and we allow that room for ourselves to relax. We are able to address every single time the things that really will create, keep a, a beautiful learning environment uh, present for our students and ourselves. All right. Hack number three is use rewards. And this is a, I apologize, this is a low quality picture of my actual classroom from years ago in Texas for, for those of you who can see, see our Texas flag there. Um, and the reason why we chose to put this picture in here is because it shows just a little bit of how I set my room up for classroom management. And these two desks that you see here are actually facing my desk, which is on the other side of the room, the other wall, looking directly at me, while the entire rest of the class is facing forward towards a second whiteboard, looking forward, right? Um, and this, these are my classroom managers. So I allow two students to sit on these sort of king and queen grown um, desks where they get to feel a little bit hidden yet also on display as a classroom manager. Um, and this is a reward that I give for excellent behavior. And I do this in two tiers, really. I allow only A students to sit in my back row. So in my very back seated rows, uh, they're just the very last row, I allow only students who have an A or above to sit back there. And that's just sort of known, you've got to have a great grade to sit back there. But the two who sit on the side over here, these are people that I have seen go above and beyond 
uh, just what what's asked of them. So that's a really special role in my classroom, and it has a, a unique um, power at all times in my classroom. So rewards are something that I, I really um, believe in, and I think that when we use them wisely, they really work in everyone's benefit. So let me pass through. And one thing that I wanted to point out is they work for all ages. Like a lot of people think of rewards as like, you know, gold star sticker systems, but that's not always the case. Sometimes there can be rewards like this classroom management uh, special seat that you mentioned that even older students really want because they want to be able to stare at everybody and have nobody staring at them. So uh, you can find the things that incentivize even older students. So true. In fact, I was thinking of like gold stars myself and I thought I don't even know rewards when I when I was mulling through this, but absolutely. Uh, one thing about getting to know our students is it helps us know what would be a reward, right? What would be a good reward? What would they feel is a worthy reward? So giving privileges, classroom managers, they're the ones who take attendance for me, even though I have to take attendance myself, but it's still worth the exercise. Uh, they pass out papers for me, they leave class to run attendance up to the office, um, or they, you know, they escort other students and maybe need to go to the library or do something else. Um, I also do class rewards. So this little picture on the right is a picture of one of my Halloween doors since we were in the spirit of Halloween moving into October. These are classroom rewards where, or all, you know, full class rewards, where it's not just an individual student, it's if we can accomplish this learning objective today, if we can focus and work smarter and achieve our goals for our class period, then we'll take the last seven minutes and you can decorate the door. This did work like a charm. They loved it, did a cute job. This is for us this creepy class. So that was fun. And these, these were seventh graders. I um, mean, one thing I want to mention is to uh, sometimes rewards are, you know, for explicit behavior or um, academic achievement, but also if you recognize your students for their values or for their characteristics, for being a good friend, for being very helpful to a new student, um, for being compassionate to someone who's crying or hurt or angry. Uh, these, are, these are beautiful things to reward students for and to acknowledge them for. So I just encourage acknowledging values and accomplishments maybe not just accomplishments. Um, so I think we'll pass off to Kari for this one for pack number four. Yeah, sounds good. Oops. Forgive my messy screen for a moment as I switch over to presenting. So I wanted to talk, let me move this. I wanted to talk specifically about brain breaks um, because I think for young and older students, it's really important that they have a way that they can get their energy out because a lot of times when a student is being disruptive, it's because they really have too much pent up energy. And so sometimes taking movement breaks can model healthy behavior. As a person who works from home, I know I have to take movement breaks. And so you're starting that when students are young by introducing brain breaks into your day. So uh, one thing that I always love is leading the class in a short exercise or song. And I'll give a few very specific examples of that. So one that I want you guys to kind of look up after this webinar is uh, if you look up teaching and so forth, she has a really great example of a fun class song. Um, so you can use your class contract to then make lyrics for a class song and you can have the students come up with dance moves and that can be really um, a great way to either, you know, have it break up your day with a certain routine like maybe it's always at a certain point in the day that you do their, their song. Um, then there's also the possibility of using hand motions or dance movements or your hands to memorize. So we probably all know the like multiplication tables where you put down the finger. There's also the um, Bill of Rights, remembering the Bill of Rights with finger movements. 
And on the next slide, I have an example from Kelly Bordeaux Piano of how you can use your hands to um, know, uh, identify the note in music and know which hand you should be playing with. So uh, yeah, just incorporating that little bit of movement, even though it's just your hands, can be a nice way to redirect energy and kind of uh, change the environment and the um, focus for a moment to do a little brain break. So you're thinking about your hands instead of mm, crunching through a problem. Uh, so then the other thing that we have on the next slide is an example from OT for Schools, one of our publishers, uh, and she has a lot of really great boom cards that have examples like stop and freeze to improve listening skills, clapping games, exercises. Um, so all of those make really great brain breaks. So let's look at some of these examples. On the right, we have a sensory movement break. And then if you look on the left here, we have a set of boom cards. Um, and we'll include the link to these in the chat to all these different ones uh, where we have actual yoga poses. So a way to break up the day with yoga poses and affirmations. And then at the bottom, we have that exercise I told you about from Kelly Bordeaux piano with using your hands and the, um, for the piano keys. And so one anecdote I just wanted to share is that when I was, I think in 10th or 11th grade, I had a teacher that taught us this song for slope. So she, I don't know, I think she made it up, but it's possible she co-opted it from somewhere else, but it was set to, um, the tune of a Gloria Stefan song. And we did this slope song and we did it every day in class for probably a month. And we had so much fun with it. You would think that students who are in 10th or 11th grade would be too cool and too old to enjoy that. But I can tell you that I have all of the lyrics still memorized, even though now I'm 36 years old, I could still sing you that song about slope and remember the formula from that. So some of these tricks, they're not just brain breaks to recalibrate um, everyone and get them on the same page as far as uh, exercising their energy so that they can then calm down for a more low key activity next. It's also, there's something about movement that makes things very memorable. And it's possible that students will remember your class 20 years into the future because of these brain breaks that you chose. Okay, thanks, Corey. Yep. All righty. All right. <laughs> we need a little brain break right now. Everybody dance it out. All right. Um, fact number five are exit tickets. <laughs> Again, something that I'm sure we've all used and heard of. And I know that we've got tons of teaching experience on the call. So so happy to hear that. I'd love to hear everyone else's facts as well, what really works for you, or sort of the thread that runs through all of these things that we implement or that we may have implemented or may not have tried to implement because we thought, hmm, that's pretty basic. I understand that. But uh, once we implement them, something like exit tickets, which is hack number five, um, this is just a, um, a quick way to, again, find out what did they learn today in your class or in you know the the topic that you were discussing, what did they, what stuck with them? So this was part of my bulletin board. Again, I wasn't, I wasn't taking professional photography pictures at the time. It was just, I was just proud of myself for lining up those cards. I tell you, I was just, it took me forever. Um, but this is where I, this is one through 30 of these little cards up on the bulletin and the students have numbers one through 30 on their desks. And so before, you know, the last three minutes before they can leave class, as I just walk around, I give them all a sticky note. They have a corresponding number. They know what their number is. I will ask them, what were the five literary devices that you, we learned about today? And even if they have to turn to our neighbor and say, what were, what were the other two? You know, this is reinforcing learning again. And it's also giving me a quick check for what stuck with them. So 
part of the fun of this as well, especially in middle school, is that when they're finished, they get to come up and sort of snack the side of the wall and they all think that's pretty fun and pretty cool to do. But it immediately allows me to scan all of these sticky notes and basically stick these sticky notes into two piles. One is they got it, they got it, they got it, they got it. The other is totally did not get it. I'm gonna have to circle back and reinforce this learning or reteach again once I see that. And it just it just allows us a quick way to see again uh, if we're if we're meeting the mark, has the learning objective been met, and then take that and put it back into my bell ringers in the morning. So we're using it for bell work. And so this is sort of this, this routine information loop back and forth between what do you know? What did you learn? What do we need to reinforce again and again? And it's just a great way, um, a great way to end your class, make sure that kids also will be thinking when they know this is part of your process all through their class period, I'm gonna have to show what I know or I'm gonna have to um, complete an exit ticket. So I need to make sure that I can get out of here, right? <laughs> Especially middle schoolers. They wanna make sure they can get out and start moving you know, through the hallway. And this is the same thing. We can, we can do this in elementary school at the end of you know, um, math. We can do this at the end of social studies. It, it helps us as teachers to get those quick assessments as well. And you were saying that the students love it because they'd really smack the wall. <laughs> yeah, they do actually really like it. And it does kind of keep them on their toes. So those are some of those, some of these hacks do have to do with when a student knows whether that's, do I get to be a classroom manager or am I going to have to show what I know? It sort of keeps their attention during the day of someone's watching me and someone cares what I've learned or who I am, how I behave. Um, how I carry myself and, and how I act to my fellow students all day long. And that's really what we want to do for our students anyways, is make sure that they're seen, make sure that they feel heard, and make sure that they know that they matter. So that's just another hack that helps us to, um, to teach targeted also. It helps us to target learning so that we aren't just, you know, reteaching an entire section that we can reteach specifically what we know that our students have missed. And that's just the find what didn't stick, collecting those notes, turning them into bell ringers, um, staying organized, and that's our routine, keeping our time, making sure that we've built out curriculum, leaving our, our bell ringer time in the morning or at the beginning of our class and our exit ticket at the end, making sure that we adhere to those values. One little tidbit I think that was the most or is the most meaningful to me to this day is to know your why. So, and I think all of my teachers that are on right now are like, oh, I know exactly what you mean, is the number one question. Why do we have to do this? Why are we doing this? Why do I have to learn this? Why do I have to know this? I'll just look it up. I'll Google it. All the things our kids say to us before actually engaging in our, in our work or activities is why. Why do I have to do this? And what I've really learned is that I need to make sure that I always know my why. I always know why am I having them do this? And often when you're planning curriculum or you're planning your lessons or activities each day, it is important for us as teachers to ask ourselves, why am I having them do this? And we want to make sure that we're only giving activities that we can answer our own why to, right? That will help our classroom management, that's for sure. Um, but know your why, and the why always needs to be some form of because I care about you. So however we say that, because I want you to be able to compute your finances when you're older, because I want you to be able to critically think about decisions in your life, because I want you to assess this literature so you can assess your own thoughts in your life. Um, those are answers that students appreciate and they accept. And they really want to know that they're not doing something because, I don't know, because we just want them to go through the motions. And, and all of us as teachers know that, but our students don't always know that. So I always, I always say the two things about kids is know your why and make sure your answer is always some form of because I care about you, right? Um, so that's pretty much the end of our fifth hack. One up here in the right-hand corner, we see an accommodation stamp, which maybe some of you have used, but those gen ed teachers out there as well who sort of teach everything or have different populations in your classrooms, 
this is a great time saver. Instead, I, I remember I used to cut out little pieces of paper and staple them to my students' work and write the date and have them sign it, make sure they got their accommodations. And this stamp is a great way. I saw it on another teacher's desk and I said, oh, let me see that. Uh, so that's, these are some just administrative ways to quickly uh, move through your class um, or, and to get the things done that you need to do as a teacher that don't have to do with your activities or your students in the, you know, in the class time that you have, but that you need to do right away. Um, so that's a great mini hack under staying organized. But also um, for any, if we have any new teachers out there, another thing that really helps as far as staying organized, which of course, with boom cards, things are organized for you, but sometimes we do need to use paper. Sometimes paper is our best uh, way to capture information or to remind ourselves or even to grade certain things at certain times. Um, so dividing your school year into 36 weeks does a few things. One, I think we can all just go, ah, 36 weeks or 36, that doesn't seem like very much. So we have, I had, um, Actually, I, think I, I did have, did bring them with me, but it's just, they're just uh, file separators. They're um, dividers. dividers. Thank you. Yeah. I was, oh, by the way, what's the word? Um, they're dividers and they're numbered one through 36. If any other teachers out here use this, please put it in the chat. I would love to hear. But basically, especially when I did not have a lot of resources, as I would print out my rosters, give myself five columns is that, that was my Monday through Friday. And I put each piece of paper of my roster for seven classes in each week. So week one, week two, week three. And that way I could keep track of even things like accommodations, absences, you can grade with that. If a student says I did that, you can go back to that week. It also helps you with, if you number your weeks one through 36, for my middle school and high school teachers, you can set up a file, uh, file, just a file holder of weeks one through 36 as well. And you don't have to put all 36 in at a time. You can do each nine week segment. And what you do with that is whatever you assign in weeks one through nine, you have a folder of, you have actual file hangers, hanging folders of one through nine. You drop all of that homework into each folder for the week and you're able to just say go over to week two your your work if you missed it is sitting in week two so these are these are some other organizational tips um, that go along with all of the paperwork that we deal with as teachers and just that same sort of theme of the more organized we are the more prepared we are the more we know what our why is the more we can assess our students and the more we give our students and ourselves a routine just the better teachers that we're able to be so so that concludes fact number five. And we definitely have some questions from the Q&A box. I think we want to get started with um, a question about what happens if the students don't want the reward. Have you ever had a student who didn't want to be classroom manager? And I, I have an answer to that, but do you want to answer yeah, first, no, Tiffany? Uh, yeah, no, give the answer. Let's yeah. Well, I can tell you that one of the things that I've noticed in my career as a student is that some of my teachers did the same things year after year. So then it got to the point where certain privileges were legendary. You knew about them even before you got to the fourth grade because they, they were such a big deal that the students talked about them amongst themselves. And so that can be really fun if you can create that kind of environment where um, you have buy-in from a few of the students and then they're having so much fun that it's contagious. And it makes even the most reluctant student uh, see that it's, it's a privilege that they want. But there, it's possible that you might have some students that just don't want to sit in front and be a classroom manager and that's okay too. Uh, you can always say like, hey, if, if anybody ever doesn't want this, you can talk to me privately. <laughs> and then they'll never be called out um, for being shy. Absolutely. I would also just on that note, I totally agree on that note, I would also say definitely check in with your students and say, what would be a great reward? What would make you guys happy? What would what would be a great reward for going above and beyond in my classroom or displaying academic excellence or 
being a good neighbor to your shoulder partner, uh, any of the things, any of the targets that you or the behaviors that you are trying to um, sort of preemptively, you know, avoid, um, I would ask them. Students love to suggest and they love, especially our elementary students, to have their suggestions taken. Have you ever, have you ever, um, I'm sure some of the 20 year teachers here, have you ever visited a student's house oh my gosh or run into them at the grocery store they just about died it's so sweet and cute they they love that recognition and that acknowledgement so i would check in with your students and ask what would you guys like what some of them you? when we talked about was like a letter home to their parents because a lot of the students only get a note home when they're being bad <laughs> and so getting a note home to say this student exceeded my expectations by being a great friend like something like that could really uh, change their environment at home in a way that you don't even expect. So they might have suggestions for you that are really good and really help them in their lives in other ways. And some of them might be extremely easy. They might say something like, oh, we want reading time. You know, we want you to read to us where we can put our heads down and read to, you know, and read to, great. You know, sometimes it's like a win-win. Sometimes you're like, oh, that's easier than the one that I thought of myself. So definitely yes. Um, so we did get another question from Anne that I think I'm just gonna answer directly. Uh, and she was asking about um, some of the students getting the wrong answers on purpose so that they can see what the correct answer is. Tricky, tricky. <laughs> um, so uh, she was asking about how to change the settings uh, to make sure that a student can repeat a deck just once. Um, so the answer to that is basically just that the feature that would allow a teacher to specify the number of plays on a boom deck, we'll pass that along. In the meantime, you can use custom play settings to turn off multiple plays and turn on the randomizing of cards. The other thing is that you could give them the same, as Stephanie mentioned, the same you know 50 card deck or 100 card deck that's going over the same material, but you're actually mixing up uh, the cards that they get each day by hiding the other cards. So you have five one day for um, your bell ringers, and then you have a different five the next day. So if they've done that, then it really won't help them, especially if it's going into their grade to get all the answers wrong really quickly. They'd really be shooting themselves in the foot with that one. <laughs> uh, and I know Quinn had recommended also potentially um, keeping track of their average scores. If they're doing that a lot, that just might be a way to get them out of that habit because then their first time through getting them all wrong would negatively impact their scores overall. And that is one thing I wanted to mention about boom cards, which is that, and, and rewards in general, if you're always rewarding only based on academic achievement, it's gonna potentially be the same kids week after week that get the reward. And so that's why you wanna switch it up. And within boom cards, we have rewards for perseverance. Um, so we have the coins, gems, and lightning bolts. and we like to reward different things. So from week to week, you can choose something different to reward. So it's not always the same kids getting rewarded. Uh, I'd love to know if anybody has any specific tips about your classroom setup. That's such a huge part of classroom management, like how you arrange the class. And especially since we have some veteran teachers in the audience today, I'd love to know if anybody has a favorite way of arranging their class or any tips that you might wanna share with the people watching this on YouTube later uh, that you've learned over the years about classroom management. And we also can take more questions. Um, so Stephanie, I know that you mentioned uh, separating the divider into 36 separate weeks to keep track. You, you also mentioned that then you could put the post-it notes from the exit tickets right into that binder and keep it. And there's also the ability to do that kind of digitally with boom cards. You can also always export. So we have a question from Gail. 
that's, I have a limited amount of space in a portable with 27 students. So very few options available for configurations. So do you have any suggestions for that, Stephanie? My gosh. Okay, Gail, I was in the same exact position. Actually, the photo that we shared with the classroom managers, I know that looks very spacious in that photo, but I had uh, 29 desks in there at the time and I had to add three more. It was, and it was a rectangle room. So that is very much like, um, did you say a portable? Yes, you're out in a portable. Uh, so what I had to do because I, I, I did not have the space and I actually have this here too. I would have to lean over to grab them, but I made one direction, <clears throat> excuse me, one directional traffic because the, the children really, and mine were seventh graders. I'm not sure what, what uh, grade you teach, but they were fairly big kids. Some of them were even six foot tall at, at this age. And so the one directional traffic allowed me to, I, I didn't have any space. I had maybe four feet between my whiteboard and my first student's desk, which is not a lot. I had my, my um, teacher's desk. I had those two classroom managers, which was the only spot they could go from my door to that library to pick up their journals. And then they had to go down just one tiny little back row of space. And then they could only come forward towards me. So if you can think of something going clockwise, basically my students entered, they went, you know, let's say it's a clock. They went from six o'clock up to nine o'clock, got their journals. They were allowed to walk from nine o'clock across to two o'clock. And in that space, they would come straight directly towards the board and that's it. They could not turn around and go the other way because there was no room to do that. You could not fit two bodies between those. I, I, I had them so close. So I put little arrows on the floor and I made it into a joke when I, the first students, and this is consistency as well, they would walk the opposite way with my one directional traffic. I would make like a siren noise. I'd say, Ooh, oh my gosh, you're getting pulled over. You're getting a ticket. You're going the wrong way. You know, they just thought that was goofy and that I was, you know, silly. And so they turned around and went the right way. But that is really a, a really tough thing to deal with. So if you can, I got from the dollar store little arrows about this big stickers on the floor, and it just showed that one directional traffic. And, but actually, um, that that is another example of how creating structures can actually make people feel more comfortable. So you're dealing with this limitation, right, which is a limitation in space. Heather added in the chat that she actually has the same problem with space, and she's learned that with less space to run and gather and talk, you can use it as a positive. So you might have this really spacious room, but you have a problem all the time because kids are like lounging or, or they're, you know, congregating in certain areas and it's hard to keep track of everybody at once. So I guess the classroom management tip is to kind of wherever you can turn the negatives into a positive and make it seem like it's on purpose like with your arrows. Absolutely. And it does, I, I think I really agree with that, that it, it's a very intimate space in the respect that, let's say if I were to sit in one desk, maybe in the middle, I basically had my entire class pretty close to me. You, students were not able to sort of go to the other side of the room and you know do something else. So it does kind of, it brings you, you know, sort of closer where you're all in each other's space and you really, uh, it also helps you, <laughs> It helps you to adhere to your student and classroom contracts, right? It helps you adhere to your values to make sure that everyone's being respected. got it when somebody is not adhering. And in fact, that was another kind of tip that you had mentioned before, Stephanie, um, about proximity. Can you share that? That's something that probably our veteran teachers know, but to someone who's brand new to teaching and trying to uh, get a rein in a rowdy group of students, it might be really helpful. So thanks for putting that out. And I, I know that through all your professional development and your pedagogy and all the schooling that you all have gone to, you've heard this a thousand times. I just want um, to point out that certain certain tactics, it's they're kind of like, you know, cliche sayings. Well, we say them for a reason, but proximity can be used in two ways. It can be used when you have uh, poorly behaved students doing something and you don't have to say a word to them. You don't need to get into a power struggle. You just go over and keep keep doing what you're doing with your happy attitude, standing right near them, you know, not in an intimidating way, but just so close to them that they're like, oh no, she can see everything I do. Or you can use proximity, like going and sitting with your students during a class discussion in the back of the room with them. Go be a student at one of their desks and bring, you know, come down into their level. Like you're, you're one of them. You want to know how they feel. What do they think? 
These are preemptive ways to handle uh, behavior or to keep behavior in check because it's building a rapport, it's building respect, and it's letting them know you're paying attention, you are fully engaged, you care about them, they matter, and that's just using your physical self to relay messages, whether it's you, you matter to me, I'm, I'm exactly like you, I'm one of you, or I'm going to come stand right by you so you put your phone away, you know, one of those, <laughs> any of the above. But yeah, proximity is always a great thing to use because it allows you to avoid the verbal uh, power struggle. And we have one last question and then we're pretty much out of time. Uh, but I did want to ask, this is an anonymous question. How do you stop students from constantly chatting and disrupting others? And then I had an amendment to that, which is just uh, that I had asked you, how do you stop little kids from giggling? <laughs> okay. I love the little kids from giggling. That's easy to answer. I'm not sure exactly what our minutes left are, but um, <laughs> stopping kids from giggling is stop the whole class. I acknowledge what's going on. I see that we all have the giggles here. I see that we are just like we are in, you know, infected with the giggles. And trust me, we've all been infected with the giggles, right? We have to remember what it's like to be in first grade, fifth grade, seventh grade. And let's just let's giggle as loud as we can. This is what I would do. I would just say, giggle as loud as you can. Let's make the classroom next to us think that we're having a ball. You want to? They love that. Like, oh, let's make the other class think. Laugh as loud as you want. We'll give you, you'll put it on the timer, give them 90 seconds to absolutely laugh, you know, they're, you know, themselves silly and let them get it out and then go, all right, you got it. Let's go. Let's move along. So I would, I would, it's not giving in, it's allowing what is to be, and then just redirecting, like allowing them to be humans that have the giggles and that's okay. And our objective is to learn. And so I realize you're a human being that cannot stop giggling. So let's, let's get it out and let's move on. And what about disrupting others or chatting? Um, I mean, I know this is kind of a mean one, so I don't know if I'd recommend it, but one that I had teachers do a lot when I was in school was always, oh, like, what's going on? What's the gossip? <laughs> what? Tell us all. <laughs> this one definitely depends on your age group, right? So I'm not sure the age group of the question, um, but going back to our, our class contract is that our learning environment is so that everyone can learn, so that everyone can think, can focus, can grow, can develop. And if you're stopping 27 other students or 25 other students or 18 other students from learning or from, from being able to focus or from, from doing what they know is the right thing to do for themselves, I will ask you to step out. I, in seventh grade, I will say, please step out. I'll give them a warning. Hey, I need you to quit talking and get focused, right? That's number one. Let's just ask them nicely. Hey, I need you to quit talking. Two, I'm not going to ask you again. I need you to get to work. Three, can you please step out? And usually when I ask a kid to step out, I will go outside. And the first thing I ask them, instead of saying, you can't do that, you know, that'll give you its attention. Uh, you know, I don't do that. I step outside and they say, what is it that you need from me? I always ask them that. What is that that you need right now? Because you need something other than what's going on in class. And if you can just let me know what that is, I would do my very best to see if I can meet your needs. Otherwise, you need to get back in my classroom and focus on what's going on. So those are tricky depending on your, um, your age group, but you can always loop that back with routine when they don't have an opportunity to talk. If everyone's doing a bell ringer quietly and independently, they shouldn't have that opportunity. So we want to minimize opportunities for them to do that. And often that's in transition, but that's when we don't have a routine set up. And I would say that if you're really having trouble, that's another time when brain breaks could really come in handy. Like maybe it's just some energy that needs to get expelled. Um, and after you do that, they can go back to quiet work. So yeah. I, I have to um, close out now because we're absolutely at time. So thank you so much for joining us. We really, really hope you enjoyed this webinar on five hacks, five easy hacks for classroom management. Um, just a friendly reminder that you can join us for our next webinar, which is an intro to boom learning, which we have the first Wednesday of every single month. And by registering, you'll also be signing up to receive the video recording and you'll receive the video recording of this webinar today. So you'll be able to watch it later. You'll also be able to watch it on YouTube. Um, oops. Uh, so Stephanie, can you be sure to share the final slide, which is the help, yeah. all the help info.
Um, we want to make sure that you know how to get help anytime you need help with your boom cards or boom learning. Uh, you can contact a real person. We have lots of people here to help and assist you. And uh, then we also have in the chat right now the links that we're sharing to our YouTube channel, Facebook page, and the next event. So thank you guys so much for attending. And uh, it's really been a pleasure talking about these classroom management hacks with you today. Thanks so much. Oh, thank you, Erica and Lynn and Beverly and Alyssa. We really appreciate you being here. And feel free to add in the comments section on YouTube your own hacks, because really a lot of people can probably benefit from what you've learned over the course of your career. Oh, thank you, Jessica. Thank you, Gail. Thanks, Jesse.